Hi, my name is Clinical Clarnas and you're watching the video Brown Syndrome Clinical Characteristics. In this video, we will be discussing the signs and uh, symptoms that patients present with uh, when they have a Brown Syndrome. Okay, as I mentioned earlier in the previous video, we're expecting that we'll see limited elevation in adduction. So if we have a look at this chart again in labo elevation, we have limited elevation of adduction of the right eye and we have a right brown syndrome. What we also see is normal elevation in abduction. So if we take that right eye and we have a look here, we can see that there's normal elevation in abduction. So the limitation of elevation is usually restricted to um, adduction. There are some exceptions to this rule. Uh, in instances where a patient has severe uh, Brown syndrome, and we'll talk about what severe is a bit later, uh, the patient may also have some limitation in abduction, but it's generally quite asymmetrical. In other words, uh, the limitation that you see in abduction is much smaller than that you see in adduction. We'll also see an absence of the muscle sequelae. So a Brown syndrome, because it's mechanical in nature, generally does not have uh, the associated muscle sequelae. However, uh, you may see an overaction of the superior rectus, uh, which is the yoke muscle or the contralateral synergist. And this is probably the most common um, sign that you'll see associated with the muscle sequelae. But generally, down gaze will be fine and you won't see for instance, the ipsilateral uh, antagonist overacting. In terms of um, A and V patterns, e, a Brown syndrome is more regularly associated with a V pattern. If we have a look at the child to the right here, from prior position up, gaze and down, it does appear that this child may have a V pattern, although that um, position there in direct elevation is, is slightly looking over to the left, which makes it difficult to, to assess. And the last thing I mention here is the positive force duction test. Because we're talking about a limited movement or limited movement due to a mechanical restriction, the force duction test will be positive. So a short um, superior oblique tendon or an inelastic superior oblique tendon will produce a force, positive force duction uh, test, as will, um, as other examples, a an overtucked superior oblique. So an iatrogenic uh, superior oblique will also give you a, a positive force duction test. And here we have a HES chart of a patient with a Brown syndrome. They have a right Brown syndrome. We can see that the inferior oblique is underacting in the outer field and it's underacting in the inner field. Now, I know it says inferior oblique here and I'm discussing the fact that the inferior oblique is underacting as uh, in terms of what we're seeing on the HES chart. But a Brown syndrome, as I've indicated earlier, the eye isn't elevating in adduction. So it's actually the superior oblique that's the problem, but you're not going to see that on the HES chart. What you'll see is the limited elevation in adduction. What we see that's characteristic of a Brown syndrome is that in down gaze here, the ipsilateral antagonist is um, unaffected, both in the outer and in the inner field. And again, the other characteristic component is the overaction of the superior rectus as the only other um, component or over under action that we see in the Brown syndrome. There are other findings that are associated with the Brown syndrome, so let's go through these. For some patients, we'll see a down shoot or a down drift on adduction. If we have a look at the patient uh, here to the right, we can see that they look relatively aligned in prior position. And then as the patient looks over into adduction, there is a downshoot um, of that uh, left eye uh, in adduction. And then as we go up, we can see a significant uh, Brown syndrome here or a significant limitation of elevation in adduction. Okay, so that downshoot doesn't occur in all patients, and we'll talk about classification in a moment um, or in a, in a separate video, uh, how do we go about uh, classifying a patient according to some of these associated signs. Uh, the other thing that you may see is a widening of the palpable fissures on uh, adduction. And in this particular instance, as the girl has crossed over into um, dextroversion, there does appear to be some widening of the palpable fissure there. That's not seen in all patients. Uh, in some patients, though, you, you may note it. For some patients also, there may be a hypotropia in prime position. 
Uh, and this is usually associated with the uh, superior oblique being short, pulling the eye down. Patient may also comment that they feel some discomfort uh, on attempted elevation in, in adduction, and that's most likely associated with patients who have uh, nodules or inflammation uh, of the uh, superior oblique. And as I mentioned earlier, for some patients, you may uh, witness the click syndrome, where if there is a nodule uh, with repeated attempts to elevate the eye in adduction, you may see improvement of um, elevation in adduction with the um, nodule passing through the trochlea and allowing the eye to elevate when uh, previously it didn't. Now, if you suspect your patient has Brown syndrome, you will obviously need to consider differential diagnosis. And the conditions that are most notably considered uh, for differential diagnosis is the inferior oblique palsy, the double elevated palsy, and the uh, floor blowout fracture. I'll talk to you about the inferior oblique palsy um, uh, in, a, in a moment, but let's just focus on the next two. You recall uh, in the video series on third nerve palsies that a double elevator palsy is where you have limited elevation in all positions of elevation, so dextra elevation, labor elevation, and direct elevation. Now, generally, the uh, limitation of elevation is relatively symmetrical across those three positions. There may be some difference, but it's, it's relatively the same. For a Brown syndrome, generally there's only limited elevation in a deduction, and even if there is a severe case where you get limitation in a b deduction, then in these instances it tends to be quite asymmetrical. The other difference is that you'll have a forced deduction test that's positive for a Brown's and negative for a double elevator palsy. In terms of the blowout fracture, the history will uh, usually give you some indication that uh, you're looking at a potential uh, blowout fracture. And you'll have signs such as bruising and swelling around the eye. But again, a blowout fracture where you have the floor affected and prolapse of tissue or an entrapment of muscle, usually you'll see symmetrical issues in elevation. So dextra elevation and um, labor elevation will both be equally affected as compared to the inferior oblique palsy. Sorry, as compared to the, the Brown syndrome. Now returning to the inferior oblique palsy and the differential diagnosis between a Brown's and an inferior oblique palsy, uh, I've provided you here with a table that differentially diagnoses or gives you some of the differences between uh, clinical investigations and what to expect of the outcomes between those two conditions. So in a Brown syndrome, um, firstly, there may, not, there may not be a deviation in prior position. Now we have said that there may be a hypotropia and that's an associated sign, but that doesn't always occur. So where you have a limited elevation in adduction with straight eyes in prior position, then you're more likely to be having a Brown syndrome than a uh, inferior oblique palsy, which should be causing a hypo deviation in primary. In terms of ocular movements, because Brown's is mechanical, ductions um, should be equal to versions. Also, the forced duction uh, should be positive as well. And for the inferior oblique, um, it'll be otherwise. In terms of alphabet patterns, I mentioned earlier that the most common alphabet pattern that you'll see in a Brown syndrome is a V pattern. However, an inferior oblique palsy is an A pattern. So this is also a distinguishing or assist you to um, differentially diagnose between the two. In terms of muscle sequelae, we've discussed the fact that usually you don't see um, components of the muscle sequelae and at most you'll see the superior rectus or the contralateral superior rectus overacting. And uh, generally, if you look at torsion or the Bilchowski head tilt test, the Brown syndrome, because it's mechanical in nature, you won't see um, torsion in prior position and the Bilchowski head tilt test should be negative as opposed to the inferior oblique. Okay, before we conclude, I just want to bring your attention to the natural history of Brown syndrome. Now, with Brown syndrome, some patients can spontaneously improve with time and as they age. And some reports or some studies have reported that up to 75% of patients could spontaneously improve. Now, as to why this happens is, um, is still debatable. Some have suggested that the tendon becomes longer or elongates over time. Others have suggested that where there is an abnormal tendon trochlea complex, there, this may resolve or improve over time and with age. The other point I want to make is that even where there isn't spontaneous improvement, the cosmesis of the Brown syndrome does look better 
as the patient ages. And what I mean by this is that when you have a child with a Brown syndrome, due to the height of a child, the child is constantly looking into up gaze. And so for parents and for others, it's noticeable that there is an issue in up gaze because the eye isn't elevating in adduction. However, as the child ages and becomes taller and taller, the position of up gaze is not utilized as frequently or can be avoided more easily. And as such, whilst there may be specifically no change to the Brown syndrome, it becomes less of a cosmetic issue because it's not presenting itself as frequently or people are not noticing it as frequently because the patient is no longer utilizing that position of gaze as frequently. We'll talk about management in a separate video, but keep this in mind as we discuss how we manage these patients. You need to consider that as they get taller, they're going to use up gaze less frequently and therefore the cosmesis or the issue or any cosmetic issues present at childhood may not be um, an issue later on. And secondly, there could be spontaneous resolution or improvement of the um, of elevation in adduction. Okay, so in summary, um, the key finding that will guide you towards the possibility of a Brown syndrome is limited elevation in adduction. The moment you see limited elevation in adduction, you should be considering the possibility that you have a Brown syndrome. And the definitive test that tells you it's a, um, a Brown syndrome is the positive force duction test. Now, this won't work with um, uh, blowout fractures because a blowout fracture is a mechanical restriction, but when you're looking at neurogenic versus mechanical, such as an uh, inferior oblique palsy versus a, a Brown syndrome, obviously one would be negative and uh, for the Browns it would be positive. Always remember you could see spontaneous resolution and tell your patients that this is the case and ensure that um, you differentially diagnose Browns from other conditions. That brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.